It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Dana Powell. Uh, Professor Dana Powell is now the uh, associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the Appalachian State University. So Professor um, Powell received um, her PhD in anthropology from the University of North Carolina at the Chapel Hill. For many years, Professor Powell has already devoted herself to um, understanding the life experiences of the environment risk and the extractive industry and the ongoing colonialism in native North America um, and the Navajo Nation in particular. So uh, her first book, which I brought here, the um, landscapes of power, the parties of energy in Navajo Nation examines the controversial power plant initiative in American Southwest. So in today's talk, Professor Howell is going to share with us her new project, which deal with the um, triple threats to Navajo Nation's um, daily life. That is the contamination, the um, of course the COVID nineteen, and the uh, which is the last one? Sorry, oh, the climate change, of course. Um, well, once again, let me just say a word of, of thanks to everyone for making me feel so welcome for this invitation. Um, and I offer this talk today, I will be reading from a paper, um, but this is a paper that's a, a draft and I really invite your feedback on it. One of the things I'm hoping to do in this work is to invite some cross-disciplinary, transnational, and, inter and, um, and it's a lively discussion across sites that I actually think have a great deal in common. Um, so it's unexpected that I'd be speaking to you at a moment when Taiwan is, um, has COVID-19 very much again on our minds. And so my humble hope is that the words that I have to share about the impacts of coronavirus in the Navajo Nation and other indigenous nations might have some relevance um, for some of the questions that we're all asking here today. So we'll see. Um, it's a very different sort of context and circumstance uh, given national events than I anticipated. So perhaps that will play out well for our conversation. The, as the talk goes on, you'll see I'm kind of modifying the, t the title, but what I'm inviting us to think about today is climate change in a time of COVID-19, living and transforming the syndemic in the Navajo Nation. We'll begin with a slide that I'll invite you, if you can see it, to read on your own. I received this poem and this video in a series of text messages from a close friend. I offer it here with his permission to summon the empirical stakes of this project, that of one biological life, but also the wider collective political historical life to which we each are responsible. Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben distinguished this as Zoe versus Bios, that is the biological fact of bare life or Zoe versus the manner in which life is lived our social and political life, or bios. In Diné, or Navajo thought, a distinction in forms of life is not so dualistic. Life, or ina in the Diné language, is blood, kinship, and vibrancy. And it extends beyond humans into a wider network of relationships, or k'e, that are also constitutive of political and social life. In these lines that you see here before you, we see the poet reckoning with his own ina. Earl Tooley reflects on life as lineage as he contemplates his own transition. The poem anticipates chemotherapy treatment for lymphoma, his cancer most likely caused by exposure to the radioactive remnants of the Cold War and its weapons science in the American Southwest where he lives. The nuclear cycle, which ran full circle from extraction to detonation in the U.S. Southwest, is a techno-scientific and political infrastructure shaping the experience of three generations of Diné people. 
I met Earl in the summer of 1999. I was assisting Earl and others in the Navajo Nation in their efforts to push for an amendment to the Federal Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, a modest relief for uranium workers impacted by radioactivity. Earl had not worked in the mines himself. He was far too young at that time for that experience. But he had seen a generation of men before him become ill from their labor. Our work was buoyed by a moratorium on uranium extraction passed by the Navajo Nation in 1994. Under leadership that identified the practice of uranium mining as nothing short of genocidal. Earl and I have collaborated ever since. He's been my primary Diné teacher, mentor, and co-thinker for over two decades. I open with his poem today to underscore what is at stake in these stories, life itself, and to position myself and the ethics of my role in sharing these stories with you as a non-Diné academic who thinks and writes with Diné collaborators and yet ultimately must travel solo into certain spaces like this one. Anthropologist Peter Redfield has suggested that, quote, a pandemic carries many stories, only some of which involve the virus. Much like COVID-19, uranium radioactivity carries stories. I see my role as putting such stories into wider circulation, offering a modest interpretation and amplifying their political possibilities. In this paper, uranium contamination serves as the interpersonal, historical, ecological, and embodied backdrop against which climate change and COVID-19 in the Navajo Nation must be understood. The conditions of possibility for uranium in the first instance are also due to the formative structures and ongoing processes of settler colonialism. Its extraction from the Grant's uranium belt, which runs beneath Diné or Navajo homelands, has only ever been for global imperial designs. At the same time, uranium contamination now rearranges Earl's cellular structure while also posing a wider biopolitical threat through nearly 300 unmitigated radioactive tailings piles across the Navajo Reservation. As such, the title of my paper today is somewhat incomplete, isn't it? The syndemic facing the Navajo Nation is in fact fourfold colonialism, contamination, climate change, and COVID-19. Though seemingly separate and distinct, the collision of these, are they harms, structures, or events? The collision of these in 2020 revealed a true syndemic. The threat was, in fact, an entanglement of historically produced conditions. Medical anthropologist Merrill Singer offered the term syndemic in the 1990s as a way to understand the aggregation and interaction of two or more biological harms in a given population. Singer was thinking in terms of simultaneous epidemics and their sociocultural contexts. In 2020, when COVID-19 spiked for a third time globally, scholar Richard Horton extended Singer's insight, arguing that a syndemic is much more than comorbidity. It is the situated historical interactions of biological and social factors that expose underlying, often eclipsed forms of structural violence. These are Horton's words. COVID-19 is not a pandemic, it is a syndemic. The syndemic nature of the threat we face means that a more nuanced approach is needed if we're to protect the health of our communities. I use Horton's insight as a jumping off point. In the Navajo Nation, the indigenous territory from which Earl Tooley wrote the, the poem and where the 2020 coronavirus ranked third in the United States per capita for infections, the syndemic is evident through the analytic of water. Water transports life and death in the high desert plateau. Dwindling water resources are at the same time often contaminated from decades of intensive extraction of energy minerals, primarily uranium for Cold War weapons production, and later coal and natural gas for export to urbanize the greater Southwest. Moreover, one third of Diné households have no access to potable water or electricity, exposing the 2020 mandate to wash one's hands constantly to ward off the virus as both an infrastructural and a political problem. The Navajo Nation thus offers a microcosm for understanding how indigenous sovereignty-centered strategies of resilience may be required to mitigate and transform a quadruple threat of historic conditions. 
This map shows the Navajo Nation. It's 27,000 square miles or 70,000 square kilometers, about the size of the, nation, of the country of Ireland. Um, it straddles the jurisdictions of three United States states, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. It's a sovereign nation with a state-to-state -state relationship with the United States, guaranteed by US Supreme Court law in the 1830s. This sovereignty, constantly tested in court, recognizes indigeneity as a political difference rather than a cultural or racial difference. This is an important distinction, whereas cultural difference enables the settler state to contain indigeneity within multiculturalism as one of many racialized minorities, political difference asserts a mode of self-governance and a right to territory that predates the settler state and as such challenges the legitimacy of the federal government in those lands. Sovereignty in the Navajo Nation has been economically stabilized by long-standing dependence on energy minerals extraction, as this image shows. In fact, the modern Navajo Nation as a political body came into being only in 1924, precisely to enable the US to broker prospecting and extraction deals with Standard Oil Company. The customary self-governance, or traditional form of self-governance, called the Nachid, a loose-knit, decentralized mode led by headmen and organized around clans, appeared for federal agents in Washington, D.C. to stand in the way of bilateral negotiations between the colonial government and the Diné, such that federal agents reorganized the Diné into the Navajo Nation, a coherent political body to smooth the way for extractive deals. The map shows the layers of extractive industry in the Navajo Nation, beginning with oil in the 1920s, followed by uranium in the 1940s, coal's ascent in the 1960s, and natural gas and hydraulic shale fracturing in the late 20th century. As one of North America's most energy-rich tribes, the Navajo Nation has built an economic base of fossil fuels that has served as the primary power source for the electrification and modernization of the urban Southwest, from Phoenix to Las Vegas. This colonial entanglement, to use a phrase put forth by Osage anthropologist Jean Dennison, has meant that Diné sovereignty is profoundly material. On the one hand, it's rooted in the surface of the land, quite literally in landscape formations, mountains, rivers, plateaus, mesas, forests, that narrate the Diné past and the future on the other hand, it's rooted under the ground in energy minerals that were unknown to colonizers during the 18th and 19th century of westward expansion, but by the early 20th century were evident as the necessary fuels of modernity. As such, sovereignty required extraction and produced an extractive relation with the settler state. The result is that the Navajo Nation's economy, and this is true today, is two-thirds dependent on coal, and as recently as 2019, has, uh, the Navajo Nation has attempted to purchase coal mines in other indigenous territories, such as the Powder River Basin in Montana. All of this occurs at the very moment that coal is crumbling in other sectors due to increased concern over climate change and the urgent need for just transitions, including the so-called green and red New Deals being debated in the US right now. In late 2020, it's probably my favorite slide of the presentation. Um, in late 2020, the behemoth Navajo Generating Station, or NGS, was demolished. The collapse of the largest coal plant in the western United States was in fact the result of considerable work. It followed years of struggle by grassroots resistance organizations, Diné groups, and others to end the Navajo Nation's pursuit of sovereignty through fossil fuels. Environmental activists live-streamed the tumbling smokestacks on Facebook, a cathartic moment that seemed to symbolize a different kind of future, but as of yet, a future without guarantees. In Diné territory, the current global pandemic carries stories of infrastructural precarity and climate change entrenched in these long-standing histories of extraction. The virus has been devastating by any public health measure. The Navajo Nation ranked third on a per capita basis after New York City and New Jersey by April of 2020, just a year ago, for its rates of infection. The U.S. sent in the Federal Guard to conduct virus relief, 
managing food, rations, crowd control, and curfews. This militarized care reminded some of other Department of Defense operations in the indigenous Southwest, from the Manhattan Project's nuclear weapons lab, Los Alamos, which sits at the center of the Pueblo universe, to the Air Force Proving Grounds adjacent to the Skull Valley Go Shoot lands in Utah. Zuni epidemiologist Talia Kwandalesi has become well known in these networks for her maps which show cases as they emerged. This map shows that by December 3rd of 2020, there were 17,000 cases in the Navajo Nation with 663 deaths. She has these great images that are loading. It's a Zuni epidemiologist. Zuni is a, a native nation to the south of Navajo Nation in uh, southern New Mexico, Arizona. Here we can kind of hover and so you can get a comparative sense. So this is her data as of December 3rd. What I want you to notice in the map here, um, and again, it's not comprehensive data, but you can see a kind of comparative sense of the impact on the Navajo Nation. Uh, I, checked the, I checked the numbers yesterday so that by May, 20, by May 10th, 2021, the Navajo Nation Department of Health reports that these numbers have more than doubled with over 30,000 cases. This is significant when you consider that on the reservation, if you consider that on the reservation, there are only about a hundred and, um, let's see, whoops. There are only about 190,000 residents on the reservation. So 30,000 is actually a very high number when we think about that. So that I want you to have a sense of the numbers and the scale, and I dwell on that since this is all on our minds here today in Taiwan. Um, so, the Depart this is Navajo Nation Department of Health, updated every day, thank you, and it gives you a sense of where things are as of, as of today. Rates of COVID-19 have soared within the Navajo Nation, which has experienced a loss of elders at a devastating rate. Loss of elders, of course, also means loss of language, cultural heritage, and deep reservoirs of knowledge. At the same time, as noted earlier, mid-century coal plants are being dismantled, new solar projects are being installed, everyday life on the reservation reorganizes itself in terms of curfews, shutdowns, and possible energy transitions. Safety messaging by the Indian Health Service Public Health Department has also used local idioms of fuel and energy, reminding people to distance themselves one wood pile apart. But while the virus in this population, on this particular land base, might be fixed or cured by a vaccine, there is no swift inoculation to repair the accumulation of harms in the Navajo Nation and the wider indigenous Southwest. Many, but not all, of these vulnerabilities were wrought by 20th century extraction, uranium mining, oil, coal, and timber. These projects were enabled by settler colonial interests in Diné subterranean resources. And then for the past decade, intensive drought, marked by shifting sand dunes and dried up waterways, has occupied activists and scholars, forging new collaborations between and among indigenous geologists and anthropologists, and hydrologists. This interplay of toxic waste from energy development with drought and water scarcity has created what some analysts call the perfect storm for the virus to spread. Mm -hmm. Thus, energy systems and climate vulnerabilities have become a defining condition of life across the reservation. COVID-19 arrived into this landscape. While science may deliver the answer to the virus by enhancing population immunity, one vaccine at a time, Technological innovation has been uneven at best and indeed often toxic in the Navajo Nation. Abetted by settler interests, energy science and technology created the conditions for Cold War era nuclear industry to leave a radioactive landscape in its wake and the ongoing fossil fuel industry to reshape Diné homelands through oil and liquid natural gas. At the same time, these forces have generated a politics of neglect as mentioned that one third up to 40% of Diné households have no running potable water, and an estimated 30% have no electricity. And those are the numbers from the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. Those are tribal numbers. This deficit is striking given that less than 1% of homes in the U.S. overall lack some or all sanitation facilities. Thinking from a syndemic perspective then, 
climate change, contamination, and coronavirus will require not purely technical or scientific solutions, but rather socio-political and decolonial measures. COVID-19 has made visible a complex syndemic facing this community. Returning to anthropologist Peter Redfield's insight that a pandemic carries many stories, only some of which involve the virus, we see his longer argument that, quote, healthcare is never a, si never a singular proposition. Amid the most exceptional emergencies, people still have all manner of ordinary problems and complicating conditions. The complicating conditions in the Navajo Nation certainly include health, extraction, and climate, relations of co coloniality and development, and we see that in Earl's opening poem when he speaks of being collateral damage. And to be sure, the Navajo Nation as an energy producer has been a contributor itself to climate change with emissions from coal-fired coal power plants like Navajo Generating Station. The more profound pandemic is the collision of infrastructural precarity with climate change in this particular high desert, a predicament that is cultural, political, ecological, and legal. As such, any meaningful immunity may demand considerations of justice, equity, and continuance of life for Diné people, but led by Diné people, which may not be distributable by securitized pharmaceutical uh, microbes such as Moderna or Pfizer. We have to think beyond that kind of fix. Shortages of safe water, of food and electricity complicate mandates to social distance and maintain other measures for creating safe communities. The stakes of frequent hand washing to mitigate household transmission are particularly elevated in a territory where water's scarcity and water's toxicity go hand in hand. Many of the nation's 32,000 tributaries are contaminated by runoff from mining, the most infamous being the 1979 contamination of the Rio Puerco, when a uranium tailings disposal pond near the New Mexico reservation town of Church Rock leached, um, le leached massive, um, leached hundreds of thousands of gallons of toxic and liquid waste traveling 80 miles downstream making the river unusable. And this area, uh, this photo was taken by Mr. Tooley not long ago at Church Rock, which is still uh, remains a contaminated area. In these conditions, how do we apprehend the current public health crisis in critical relation to the more longstanding sociopolitical and ecological crisis? And how do we do so in a manner that mitigates the current crisis that both addresses individual injury in terms of immunity but also the collective body politic and the wider environment. The wider water energy landscape in the Navajo Nation is quite complicated. While there are no power lines, or very few power lines going directly to homes, some solar units are installed. The NTUA, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, has a solar unit program that comes with a monthly bill and ensures the unit for its, for its useful life. Um, as I've written about elsewhere, many well-intentioned efforts to create a useful life of technology fall flat due, um, due to a lack of capacity, a lack of long-term planning. They lay broken, dormant, and cast away material reminders of the broken promises of development. I often find solar panel arrays used for livestock shelters or other sorts of um, DIY sort of makeshift, makeshift hardware around a farmstead. Research has shown that in the first couple months of the pandemic, there was a direct correlation between the rate of COVID infections on American Indian reservations and the lack of indoor plumbing. There's a new sort of area of literature that's looking at this. In short, this water energy nexus is further complicating environmental and social justice. In the reservation, it's common for families to drive 30 minutes or maybe up to two hours to access clean spring water from either a fresh groundwater source in the mountains or a tribally designated filling station. Pickup trucks with water tanks like these in the flatbed are a fixture of everyday life and a visible reminder of the labor that's involved in obtaining clean water. Even though many Navajo homes lack indoor plumbing and electricity, hardly missing from the Navajo landscape are transmission lines. The large transmission lines that crisscross the Navajo Nation connect the most rural Diné places with many corners 
of the urban Southwest, delivering, electro, uh, delivering electrons to urban communities. And this delivery of clean water also depends on a reliable energy supply as it requires energy to move the water through the, Ari through the Arizona project downstream to Phoenix. Diné bodies, lands, and communities have subsidized modernization for the urban Southwest. Transmission lines are, vi are visual reminders and both material and semiotic of these material and semiotic connections. Contemporary Diné artists that I've been working with in recent years have caught my attention as they address these syndemic conditions in their work. I've become um, very interested in work by a number of artists, um, particularly James Joe, particularly James Joe, among others, whose interpretations of the landscape offer us a different kind of textuality for reading the, synd the syndemic. Mr. Joe lives just north of the town of Shiprock, which is along the banks of the San Juan River. The river was contaminated by the Gold King mine spill two years ago and is the fluvial body of great political dispute between the tribal government and desert border towns like Gallup that seek additional pipelines of water for urban consumption. These images, like much of his other body of work, rendered in the emerging genre of indigenous futurism. In these images, James's paintings depict dystopian futures, which suggest that the apocalypse is not only in the present and future, as is the as sort of general climate disruption literature and discourse might suggest, but that the apocalypse is also in the past and ongoing as colonization. These suggestive images crafted by a lifelong artist resonate with scholarly arguments in critical Native American and indigenous studies that point to an alternative temporality of crisis. I used to live just north of Wheatfields Lake one of the largest bodies of water in the Navajo Nation. The tall ponderosa pines and wooded mesas of the Chuska forests and the off-grid solar-powered home I lived in both eclipsed the view of the networks of transmission lines, which carried energy from Navajo coal off the reservation. These high desert forests were once the battlegrounds themselves of the Navajo timber wars in the 1990s. The surviving stumps hidden by a roadside flank of intact trees, yet still offering reminders to future generations of the widespread cutting. As the shorelines of nearby Wheatfields Lake receded and retracted over the years due to persistent drought, Red Lake just to the south dried up entirely for a while, and the pinyon harvesting season shifted. More and more feral horses foraged into the woods causing the Navajo Nation to identify feral horses as a species indicator of climate vulnerability. One summer many years after living near Wheatfields Lake, a sandstorm trapped me in my car. Along with my mother and my newborn, we were trapped in our car in the parking lot of a Holiday Inn. We waited out the blinding dust in the parking lot. These sandstorms have now become regular events. I've noticed these subtle changes over time and heard them confirmed in painful detail in June 2019 by a sheep herder in the town, the small hamlet of Dilcon, it's on the Arizona side of the reservation, not far from Flagstaff. This sheep herder described losing hundreds of livestock in one month alone to the drought. Stories were confirmed again in September of that same year when I returned to Dilcon and also to Blue Gap for focus groups with elders and heard them recount the disappearance of birds, frogs, prairie dogs, and certain plants. These were not the ordinary problems that Peter Redfield warns us about, but the alarming impacts of increasing desertification in the high desert. Rising temperatures and, sand, and sandstorm events noted by climate scientists and land managers alike. The more complicating conditions included the network of transmission lines, unmitigated uranium piles, coal ash pits, and heavy equipment that have made places like wheat fields and Dilcon, though totally opposite biomes, intimately linked as sites where drought and extraction are lived experiences. Indeed, the networks of power lines tell these stories that the virus has carried. Transmission cables carry electricity, generated by Navajo coal, to air conditioners, swimming pools, appliances in Phoenix, 
Scholars have shown that the Sun Belt's mid-century metro metropolitan growth was built via the labor and resources of a colonial development design, yielding the social production of underdevelopment in the Navajo Nation. To this day, many off-grid rural families use kerosene for indoor lighting, haul laundry several hours to a border town laundromat, drive several hours to haul water, heat with hand harvested wood, and frequently keep plastic coolers outdoors to store perishable foods or prescription drugs. The everyday life of energy is rarely taken for granted. The 2020 US CARES Act funding um, during coronavirus exposed yet another story. American Indian nations had to apply to the United States government to receive federal funds, whereas US states did not. Quote, the feds held 15 billion in our name, recounts Earl. Bitter that tribes were held to a different standard than states receiving similar aid. This inequitable process exposes the legal falsehood of the so-called TAS, or treatment as states, implicit in the status of native nations as sovereign, as sovereign entities. Treatment as states is a standard to determine if a tribe can have treatment like the state of Georgia, the state of New York, the state of Maine, for primary jurisdiction in applying certain environmental laws. Tribes are treated as states only when this is in the interest of the federal government, which retains the ultimate power of primacy and retains the power over the land, the trust status power over reservation land. Many have written now about how the CARES Act funding made it clear that Native nations are in fact treated as secondary states with sovereignty that is nested, as Mohawk anthropologist Audra Simpson discusses in this sort of federal states uh, tribes trifecta. My colleagues further lamented that the federal funding reenacted the colonial logics of recognition, sharing that the idea is if we can get attention, we can get support from the state. On the other hand, the United States legal relations with American Indian tribes is often heralded by many as among the most sophisticated and just in the world, and therefore a model for others to follow. This tension became clear under the coronavirus CARES Act funding. This contradiction between lived experiences of recognition and legal arrangements of the same gets at the relevance of these sorts of methods, perhaps, in exposing the legal tensions and frictions in play. By most measures, the US has failed miserably in this massive project of COVID-19 aid to American Indian nations. For many Diné, this is unsurprising, given the nested nature of tribal sovereignty. This is at least in part due to the dominant society's failure to reckon with, returning to Richard Horton's words, how these conditions are clustering within social groups according to patterns of inequality deeply embedded in our societies. These deeply embedded patterns of inequality include, of course, colonialism, which is often omitted from analyses of the pandemic's wider context. The virus has been devastating to be sure, but has also carried other stories that expose both the precarity and the critical resilience alive and well in the Navajo Nation. This is the work of the resistance work of activists, of artists and tribal leaders, whose work often flies under the radar of the dominant society. Transforming the syndemic also means for scholars, some reinvention of our own research methods, since on the ground, face-to-face -face research is still prohibited in the Navajo Nation, prohibited by Navajo Nation government. Work by ethnographers, geographers, and others to track the innovative practices of everyday life is suspended, even as Diné scholars, uh, even as Diné scholars themselves find it difficult and often warn against pursuing face-to-face -face research now that we are more than one year into the pandemic. This conjuncture calls for slowing down, reconsidering the pace of our work, rethinking taken for granted methods in our fields, and the public facing demands of scholarship on contamination, climate and colonialism in COVID's immediate wake. I have the privilege to be part of one such experimental project, a collaboration with a Diné geographer and a Diné anthropologist, where we're using virtual workshops to gather local experts on the topic of water toxicity and transition. This collaboration had to pivot from our original plans. We had planned a three-day in-person workshop 
of 30 or more people, which was funded by the National Science Foundation. We had to pivot to a digital collaboration that's now moving very slowly into its second year. Our goal is to think together about an interdisciplinary platform for transformative research in the face of the, of the syndemic, acknowledging the absence of the kind of empirical work we've come to count on in our respective disciplines. We know that ethnography, as usual, is not possible, nor is work in the tribal archives, with some tribal government offices are still operating only partially. So part of transforming the syndemic is facing this opportunity to decolonize our research in unexpected ways, to rethink business as usual, to look ahead and do differently. Writing a new methodology for syndemic transformations in virtual or otherwise restricted conditions, we find ourselves pushed to ask some, ask some of the most basic and yet difficult questions of our own scholarship. What is our work really for? For whom? And is the point still, if it ever was, to generate knowledge or perhaps to trace new kinds of emergent practices? What might a Diné-centered social science and humanities method entail if we take the syndemic seriously, as we do, and attend to the ethical imperatives trained towards justice and decolonization? Certainly our efforts toward co-thinking about the embodiments of injustice and environmental risk, while established by decades of natural resource extraction, have been amplified and complicated by COVID. And I'm moving here towards my conclusion. I'm moved by Danae's storyteller. There's a storyteller called Sunny Dooley. Sunny Dooley made a provocative claim last year that Navajos have, quote, the perfect body for invasion. This provocative claim is the case, Dooley argued, not because of any kind of biological essentialism, but due to the socio-political, geological, historical, and techno-scientific arrangements in the landscape that create this kind of infrastructural precarity that structures everyday life. In Dooley's community, this plays out where a naturally occurring arsenic and uranium, combined with the lack of resources to build a groundwater well, um, such that Dooley and her relatives depended upon hauling water from Gallup ev almost every day for their household use. Dooley writes, we have every social ill you can think of, and COVID has made these vulnerabilities more apparent. I look at it as a monster that's feasting on us because we've built the perfect context for it to invade. Bear with me. She's indicating the socio-political roots of health disparities, reminding us of Horton's insight on the syndemic. Dooley continued, COVID is revealing what happens when you displace a people from their roots. The pandemic carries these stories of disconnection, intergenerational trauma and infrastructural precarity, yet it also carries stories of persistence and creative resistance in people like Dooley and scores of others that are involved in our current research project, um, people in their work to dismantle economies of, based on export and dependency orient us towards understandings of energy as vitality and justice as the cultivation of life, of ina and relationality. In this vein, we are mindful of Eve Tuck's caution regarding the damage-centered research that has defined much of the scholarship certainly in North America, about native peoples. We're holding in delicate balance the need to tell stories of harm, often necessary for remediation, with the need to turn our methods in collaborative research towards joy, towards desire, and the cultivation of life that asserts resistance, presence, and self-determination. My collaborator, shown here, activist poet Earl Tooley, argues against damage-centered work in his public education efforts. Here he's broadcasting over the tribal radio station, KTNN, to encourage resistance and transition thinking instead of the further entrenchment of fossil fuels. In his first language, Deneb Bazad, he explains over the airwaves how Peabody Coal Company's intensive use of water from the Coconino Aquifer was used for decades to slurry crushed coal 275 miles to a processing station in Nevada. That carried on until the line was closed a few years ago. He critiques here the company's lack of a plan for remediation of the ecological damage 
following a half century of mining operations on Black Mesa. And elsewhere, he explains the need for a just transition into a new paradigm of energy and economic life. He calls attention to how this conjoining of public utilities, capitalist development, and tribal leases risked a pristine water source on which life in the Arizona side of the reservation still depends. And as he himself battles lymphoma, even as I write, Earl also participates in the Diné Uranium Remediation Advisory Commission, sketches plans for rebuilding his ancestral Hogan, his home place, on his late mother's home site in central Arizona, and prepares to co-lead our next virtual remote ethnography workshop on water contamination in just a few weeks. The movement is indeed intergenerational. Earl's three daughters work at the interface of indigenous thought and Western science with an eye toward water. The eldest is now the lead hydrologist for the Navajo Nation tribal government. The youngest directs a program for indigenous women in science and the middle daughter, shown here, pursues a PhD related to restoring water and food systems on the reservation. Nikki Tooley's project with indigenous food, energy, water security, and sovereignty based at the University of Arizona is a diagnostic for this endemic. Led by Diné scientist and professor Carletta Chief, it's an effort to reinvent interdisciplinary and decolonial research with applications that bolster tribal sovereignty and epistemic innovation in the face of quickening climate catastrophe and water rights wars across the Colorado River watershed. And I'll take two minutes to invite you in to this short video, which gives you, oops, which gives you a sense of the work. Gives you a sense of the landscape, anyway, and the uh, and a sense of some of the kinds of projects that are underway. And these are projects around technology, um, around foodways, and around land that are very mindfully engaged with trying to make a significant shift um, in the way in the way that the economy is in the way the economy is developed, in the way that the environment is understood, and the way that life is sustained. So in conclusion, understanding a sense of displacement as foundational to colonialism, um, I read the work of Potawatomi philosopher Kyle Powis White through the projects 
of my friends and colleagues in the Navajo Nation who are doing these kinds of life projects with a deep sense of legacies of energy extraction, the intensity of increasing climate change, and the as of yet, not yet fully known, long-term impacts of COVID-19. I read the work of Kyle White through these projects, like Nikki Tooley, Earl Tooley, and so many others, which index a non-linear, non-apocalyptic cultivation of Ina among a wider network of relations. The displacement by colonialism, contamination, climate change, and COVID that Earl Tooley and Sonny Dooley and I'll note that these anglicizations of Dooley and Tooley uh, likely derive from the original surnames, which were unpronounceable by 19th century Anglo census takers. Um, this is not re remedied by a vaccine. This is not a, not a swift inoculation towards a cure, but perhaps by a host of projects of, of collective and decolonial strategies with energy, water, and bios, the manner in which life is lived, held at the center. This materialist interpretation of justice is evident in the transmission lines, the desiccated and drying lakes and faltering livestock, but also in the knowledge keepers, knowledge makers, and social movements that push for energy justice, creating new kinds of stories that the pandemic might yet carry, stories of resilience and new possibilities for political life. Thank you for listening.